you are exactly where you need to be right here, right now, as we learn to take control of our life, uh, no matter what life handles us. This is Conversations with Susanna. We started the hour with John Lee Hoyt, who has done a lot of wonderful things for this city, active with his actions to make the city better, to make life better for people who have gone through what he has done and and survive and thrive like he has. Um, I want to thank John Lee Hoitch for being here. Then we talked to Barney, who talked to us about AA. Um, there's always help out there. The, the problem is that in life, one of the things we don't do is we don't reach out. We don't ask for the support that is available to us all the time. The person at your next desk the person at your church, the person. There is always someone who will help you if you ask, but you'll have to reach out. I'm very proud of our guest that we had today. I'm also going to tell you that in in my life, when I do appearances and when I do Facebook, I always post a positive thing every day to read. I also always do something positive every um With each show, this show is only going to be about empowering you. On Friday, we have someone coming on who will tell us about her trip down the road of life and the success she has made of herself. We're all about success. And success begins and ends with our ourself, and it begins with our decision to be successful. So... If you're not my Facebook friend, if you're not my Twitter friend, I want to read to you March's uh, phrase that I sent on on both of those. As a month that has us moving forward into the year, what is it we can leave behind to lighten our load? Are there limiting thoughts that keep us locked in yesterday's trouble? If so, let's take this month to recognize and release limiting thoughts of the past that no longer serves us. That's what our guests today have done. They have been given not the easiest load, not the easiest load to carry, but they took it, they survived, and they thrived. And then they made it better for others. And you will find as you reach out to others to support them, your life gets better. If you feel you're alone in the world, it is your illusion. We were not born not to support each other. We were born to be involved with each other because everyone, everyone has something they need to learn from us. So the affirmation for this month is, I recognize and release all thoughts that no longer serve me. So if you were given a thought like John Hoyt that said you would become nobody, he threw it away. He took his life. He made it better. One lawn at a time. One lawn at a time. You can take your life. You can make it better with your decision to do it. And that's what it is. It's a decision. It's a thought of making your life better every day, and you can do it no matter where you've been. That is what this show is about. That's why we're here for you. Please join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 to 1. We'll be here talking about things that you can use around the watercolor to sound smart. We'll give you some information how to improve your life and improve those around you. We're each other's keepers. We can make the world better once we decide. Yes, you're where you need to be. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Conversations with Susanna. Right here for you to grow with us. We'll see you Friday. Conversations with Susanna, broadcasting live on the World Herald Live app or on Omaha.com. Catch her every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 
empowering you to look for and accept the good in everything. The future is bright. We'll take a look at what's to come in yours. This is Conversations with Susanna. You are exactly where you need to be. This is Conversations with Susanna on the World Herald Live app. And you can also find us at Omaha.com, Susanna, slash Susanna. And you can uh, hear this recording time and time again. This is going to be one you're going to want to sit down and listen to because this show, Conversations with Susanna, is just about empowering you, making you stronger and better with insights that from other people who may add to your life. Today is going to be an important show. It's an important show to me because it is, we're going to be talking alcoholism, survival, thriving through the lessons of life that we have. I'm not sure you know this, but nearly 88,000 people die from alcohol-related casualties annually. There is also alcohol-impaired counted for 31% of driving facilities. I can't say that word. I've got to work on that. The economic burden that alcohol places on the, the, the government and us is $223.5 billion. Sweet Jesus, that's a lot of money. We talk about how we have to cut costs on education, on everything else, um, but it's going to take care of alcohol drunk drivers. It's taking care of alcohol-related problems. So let's step ahead of the game. Let's become a little bit more powerful with our discussion today. Please note, this will be on the, the, the Omaha.com and Conversations with Susanna. Both of those, you can download it, pass it on, send it away to anyone who doesn't know that their actions have repercussions. And that's the key lesson for this show. Today, I'm very honored to have in the studio, and what is your name, young man? John Lee Hoich. Da- John Lee Hoich. And you tell me, you're an Omaha native? Uh, born in Consabluss, actually. Came uh, over on the Mayflower over the Missouri River and landed in <laughs> Omaha. <laughs> and landed in Omaha. And there is a John L. Hoich uh, Center, is there not? Uh, there's the John L. Hoich Alumni Westside High School uh, alumni house at 90th and Pacific, and then the John O'Hoich uh, Recovery Center uh, associated with the beautiful Stevens Center program. Marvelous. The Stevens Center program, that's a program you s- help start or help? Absolutely not. They've been around by the Sharon McNeil and her husband founded it, mm-hmm. and I was just honored uh, on the planning department about nine years ago. I've served 18 years, almost 18 years on the planning board in Omaha, uh, been honored to serve, and uh, one <coughs> one year, uh, about nine years ago, the uh, Stevens Center wanted to knock down a bar at 27th and Q. Which you had some kind of reference to before. That is Tell exactly me about right. that bar. Well, that bar was a, a nightmare for many lives, ruined a lot of lives, and it was the bar that my uncle built in the late 20s, and my father, John George Hoich, inherited it in 1949, along with a half a million dollars, Back there, that was a lot of money. That's a lot of money now. A lot of money uh, now. He inherited that money and inherited the bar debt-free and ran uh, one of the very successful uh, bars that was on every street corner in the South Omaha days of the packing houses. And Mm -hmm. the people would eat uh, or they'd go work all day at the packing houses and come and drink there all night, unfortunately. My father happened to be one that wasn't a real good businessman like my uncle who died in 49 and left him everything. My uh, father happened to drink all the profits. And, you know, I find that in a lot of bars, that the owners drink the profits. It's, it, you would think it. And we're talking alcoholism. Your father was an alcoholic? Yes, he was married with three daughters prior to meeting my mother. And then he met my mother. Uh, later I found out um, that uh, helping uh, him out in his house, and then he ended up marrying her when I, uh, when I was young, and then we had four sisters and then a brother. And during that period, uh, we learned that his alcoholism ruined his first marriage and and uh, three daughters, and that ended in divorce. And then my mother 
went through pure hell, uh, being a spouse of an alcoholic. Tell me, what is the hell of a spouse of an alcoholic? What, what is the hell of a child of an alcoholic? It was a dual situation to where he would work and come home at 11 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And then he would uh, argue with my mother while we're all trying to go to bed and get to school the next morning at 730. So he would come home and uh, roll us all up, pull me out of bed, five years old to 11. And I can't remember any night other than the nights he would come home and scream and yell with my mom, uh, punch her. Uh, abuse my sisters, punch them, and do things that he shouldn't do. And then he'd pull me out of bed at 11 at night as well and take me in the hallway, and it was like a ritual. Uh, His violence Mm -hmm. would come out at home and not at the bar. So at the bar, he was Mr. Cool, Mr. Drunk, Mr. Flirt, Mr. Gambler, Mr. Whatever. Uh, He'd come home and then was putting all the pressure and all the meanness on us family, and he would beat me, throw my head through drywall, and all I can remember as a child from 5 to 11 at the time that they divorced when I was 11 with the restraining order because he tried to kill us all night with a steak knife. And wow. uh, so he would beat me from 5 to 11, and I'd go to school with bruises, and he would tell me I was a no-good, rotten little bastard, never amount to nothing. Well, you know what I find interesting with that that whole story is that most people probably in the bar had no idea that he was this vicious, correct? That is correct. At the At the bar, he was Mr. Cool. So... Do you think that is a tendency that alcoholics can have that they can hide their alcoholism to the point and then and then in other points be abusive to people or absolutely uh, correct I think that a lot of people with their addictions and not just alcoholism but drugs mm-hmm. um, sex gambling whatever it is any addiction can be hidden with because they become phonies to themselves and con artists to others uh, to survive their addiction, they try to hide it in front of the people that uh, they don't want to see, and they could care less about the people that see it that uh, the are the closest to them, the family. I mean, you're, we're honored to have children, and yet so, so many of us don't know how to cherish them. Addictions, how do you, what do you call an addiction? Being raised by an alcoholic father. So would you call someone who... Who drinks a little an addiction? What would you think an addiction is? You know, I asked my doctor that about a week ago, just for the hell of it, because I have a hard time Perfect drinking. Timing. I have a hard time drinking ever because I've never smoked, never did drugs, and I've hardly ever drank much. Uh, you know, I have a glass of wine once in a while, and I said, you know, maybe I had to have one once and more, more for my heart. I'm 57 now. Do right. I, they say a glass of red wine is kind of good for you. Mm-hmm. He said it is. If you have one. A night, maybe even two at the most, uh, it would probably relax you and maybe settle you down and keep your blood pressure low, and it's nothing wrong with it. It's uh, not abusing it. Mm-hmm. But you have more than two, and it starts to become not just something as a casual situation. It would become an addiction. It's mm-hmm. becoming that you're addicted and relying on that to completely release you from everything, and when you have to do that with alcohol or drugs or even workaholism or anything can be addictions, and uh, alcohol happens to be the legal one and until this stupid marijuana thing that's coming on trying to legalize, which is hard for me as a parent. Because they don't understand it kills brain cells. I mean, everybody can find excuses for, you know, I, for their, their problems. Everybody can find an excuse. And we talked about how much money it, it costs, but it's crucial to the families. Um, my son was hit by a drunk driver, and he's now being cared for by the government. And that's costing the government a heavy state, you know. No, something I couldn't do. Uh, not many mortals can handle the the cost of alcoholism in the daily life. Out of curiosity, did you ever want to? Well, before I go into that, I must tell you, I have a client, or, or several friends. And what I tell them is if they can not do something for 40 days, it doesn't own you. If you have to have it every day, it owns you. And I, I believe that the important thing, John, in the world is you to own everything, not for the, the drug, the alcohol to own you. So I, I know several people for Lent who give up their substance problems. Um, we're talking now about your book. Tell me what made you write the book from the ground up. 
It's not just a business. I wanted to always write it because as being from 5 to 11, told by the person who you want to love and trust the most, your mom and dad. And who you want to believe. Correct. And you're told to believe. Go ahead, sneeze. I'll talk. (laughs) So my father was my supposed to be my leader and Mm -hmm. my hero. And when he made me feel 100% uh, worthless because that's all he ever told me, then you become to believe that in your monkey mind in the back of your head, no whether you're spiritual or not. When you're told over and over and over, no different from the forty times, forty days that you talked about. Right. When you hear it every day that you know that you're no good, rotten little bastard. Well, never. in the formative years, especially. I mean, this was from a childhood thing. Right. Okay. And so that's all I knew. Okay. So I wanted to write a book. After going through the abuse and after being watched them beat my mother and. And beat my sisters and beat me. You know, my mother having four nervous breakdowns, and my father who had enough money to drink but bankrupt the the bar that became the recovery center later on, uh, which was what I'd like to finish before we get done to how We're it happened. We're going to talk about that. Bottom that. line is, uh, he kept beating my mother until she had four major n- nervous breakdowns. The uh, courts took us away from him because of the physical abuse. And uh, so we were all split up and put in four different foster homes, four different times, all through a period of 1970 to 74. And then my mother died in front of all of us at 39 from a major heart attack due to the hardening of arteries from all the beatings and the stress. So he, in our opinion, killed our mother. Oh. Out of curiosity, did you find reprieve at the foster care? Were all of you kept together? Were you separate? No, we were all most of the time split up, and it was miserable. We were all put in... A couple of the foster homes were 100% miserable and not well uh, organized and made our lives even worse. I, I'm glad they monitor them more. Everything's being monitored more. And and when you'd go to school with the bruises and nobody would ask you or nobody would get involved? They did ask a lot of times. But back in the 60s, those were the days your teachers could beat you. And you go home and say, my teacher hit me. And they said, Why? And I'd say, I'm not, I don't know, well, did you deserve it? I mean, back in the 60s, the rules were all different, where today you cross-eyed at a student, they sue you. That's exactly right. I want to read what the book says in front of it. It says, his story begins with his path from cruel family life to near bankruptcy in his early 20s to his creation of a vast business empire that led him to become a millionaire by the age of 30. So my whole goal was is to prove my daddy was wrong, and I've lived with it at 57 years old. I finally released it last year, and it took me a lifetime to get rid of it. But Even though you had succeeded, when tell me how you succeeded. What did you do to make your money? What did you do? Because you know people are are thinking, well, I have no ability. Mm-hmm. I I don't know how to I don't know how to get past my garbage. What did you do? Now, you supported your sisters, correct? I helped in every way I could to help my sisters and my little brother who died at 21 of a heart attack. And I have my four sisters are still alive, and uh, they all persevered on their own. Mm -hmm. I did everything I could do to assist them at all that I could and whenever I could and whenever they asked me. I did anything I could. I loved them with all my heart. And so what I did is I worked hard 12 hours a day, six days a week, and always took Sunday off for church. To prove to my dad that he was wrong, and I, the only thing I inherited was a Sears Craftsman lawnmower that a started Sears the business. Sears Craftsman lawnmower, I yeah. love that. So you took the lawnmower and you went and mowed every yard I could, and I saved all my money and bought real estate and uh, had a goal and made it happen and made my first million at 30 years old. And the dream was to, you know, to to have success, but the the goal was to tell my dad he was wrong, who died when I was 21 at 70 pounds of cirrhosis of the liver, and he was 260 pounds before he uh, got sick with cirrhosis and died at 57 in a VA hospital. In a VA hospital. So you started with a lawnmower. Okay. Now, as I understand it, you're a president of your, your own business, the enterprises. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also help people find jobs. Is that correct? Tell me I, about I it. I did a, that a lot. When I was in high school, I started an employment agency and helped 300 kids find a job to you prove. You started an employment agency in high school. What made you think you could do that? Because I saw kids always bitching that they couldn't find a job. Right. And I went out and 
saw 300 owners of businesses at 16 years old and placed them all on the Joni Ballion show on Channel 3 back then and, and placed all those kids a job to prove a point that if you ask, you will, you'll find it and succeed. And so anytime you want something, you can overcome an adversity. You can overcome anything and just have it inside your heart and your soul that you want it. You can make it happen. Nothing can hold you back. And I believe that. I proved it. And it works. And what what made you learn that? Do you think it was because of the church? Did the, it was, was because of the beatings from my father as alcoholic child. I wanted to prove that he was wrong. I wanted to prove that I could become something and that I wasn't so worthless. So that was your motivation? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So tell me, you worked six days and went to church. What made you do that? To have the, you needed to do that. I mean, if you're going to start a business from scratch, in the beginning it's hard work and and uh, you have to do everything you can. But I, the church is because I, I believe in God and I believe that the, without the Lord I never would have also made it. But I give Him the credit and the glory. But I also, you still have to work hard. Yeah, He, he gives you the opportunities to show His glory. Don't Correct. You, that deal. Now, as I understand it, you're now a. Pre- uh, on how many boards in Omaha? I mean, you. I mean, what I love, you're raising your two sons by yourself. Is that correct? Uh, no, my wife, wife my ex-wife, is, is an excellent mother, and I okay. get the boys every other week. Every other and, week, uh, she does a great job. She's a super mom, and I'm a loving dad, and we communicate well with our 17-year-old boys that go to Millard West, great soccer players, and they don't do drugs, alcohol, and no vaping. Okay, and so here's the scoop. What do you think? What do you think your purpose and 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 being close to your wife, and being a good parenting, I, I wish every every divorcee would do that. I, I mean, I what it. made you do that? What made you decide not to make her the villain? I never once called her a name and never belittled her to nobody, especially my sons, because I wanted that as a child. I wanted my dad and my mom to love me like they're supposed to love their children, like all people in the world should support and love their kids and when you don't give them that love and that empowerment then the empowerment can't happen my mother gave me all she could but my dad gave me none my wife ex-wife and myself have given our children love from the minute out of their womb and uh, given them the support that we love them and i've been begging them to understand that that uh, you are exactly where you need to be this is conversations with Susanna on omaha radio World Herald Live is right where you need to be. You can go to omaha.com slash conversations with Susanna and find this show later. Um, Or you can just go to conversations with Susanna. Right now I'm talking to John Hoich. Did I say your last name? Yes, you did, right. Oh, my God, I'm so proud of myself because I really crucify names. John, we we have only a few more minutes with you, so... I want to talk about what you want to talk about. Um, right after you, we have Barney, who's coming from AA. He's a, uh, le- a leader of AA in another town for 11 years, and we'll be talking to him. Um, but you have a couple of things you want to talk about. Let's talk about the alumni. Well, well, first of all, you never went to AA. You went to... Alateen. Alateen. How supportive was that for you? It was excellent. It helped me through my teens, and... So my, what I was going to say is that uh, kids of alcoholic parents or spouses of alcoholic parents or the alcoholic, we're all in, you know, it's all a team effort, especially when the alcoholic decides to help himself because he's the one or she's the one that has to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the alumni, what I wanted to just say was it was an honor at Westside that I was being the, the, a, a divorced child of a divorced family. I came back and helped kids overcome adversity. And the whole thing with the Stevens Center, which I think is the greatest program in Omaha, Nebraska, with Dale Bomberger, the director, and the, and the guild and the team, they are an excellent program. But they gave me the opportunity to be a donor. They do all the work. I do nothing. I was just an honor to be the donor. But the neat ir- irony that I wanted to really tell fast is that it was where my father's bar was, and they bought it and knocked it down through my donation and many others, and what was the first and last chance bar now is giving people a second chance. And the heroes of the alcoholics that go there and say they want a better life and a, and get back with their families and get back in the working world or whatever they want to become, even a counselor, whatever, that they go through the, 
the, the recovery center at the Stevens Center, which is the HERO program, and it's just done miracles. Now, watching these people go in, and then they become back to the world in a healthier place and not drink anymore through AA meetings and through the support of the Stevens Center, it's just been an honor to be part of the uh, little part that I've been able to do with my seed and all the wonders they've done. And the Rick Pettigrew new apartment deal under, above the new the homeless shelter that was just opened a month ago, their program is just a absolute wonderful. Wonderful. So, you know, nothing is to be discount the seed. Without the seed money, they couldn't have done anything. But after uh, looking up your name, I first that's the first time I saw the Stevenson Center. Tell me about it, and how do people become involved in it? Are, do they take volunteers? Is it uh, open to people who are struggling? Do you know much about that? Well, I, if you if if someone is decided when they come to the homeless shelter, there they don't let them in if they're drunk or high. They want them to, but they take the homeless that aren't that way, and they help them, and they give them a beautiful place to eat and sleep, and then they encourage them to become into recovery and to get back with their life. And their program is so well put together, and so well was supported by by many many people in this uh, United States and Omaha, the most. And their program also helps them empower themselves to get you know through the uh, treatment and get through the program, and now they even have an apartment program that they can live there and through the uh, succession of getting back out into the the real world. And the Stevens Center, you can call them the Stevens Center to go there for recovery and get mm-hmm. your life back in order for drug, alcohol, mental illness. And and the Al-Anon that you went to. Alateen. Alateen. Did you go by yourself? Did your mother suggest it? How my mo- my mother you? back when I was... 12 years old got us into it and I stayed in till I was 19 and was the chairman from 16 to 19 and I just I really think that any alcoholic family if the mother knows the father or the father knows the mother's an alcoholic and there's home problem to get him into Alateen the spouse into Al-Anon and by all means we pray that the the alcoholic finally realizes he is or she is an alcoholic and gets help and goes through the program the AA program is the best so Alateen, you're, you're, at that point when you went to Alateen, your father was still drinking? He drank all the way till he couldn't drink anymore, and he died of that cirrhosis of the liver. And you still felt that it was supportive to you. So if, if someone out there has an alcoholic in the family, it would still be supportive to them to go to one of these groups. Because it educates them how to cope with that person's problem. And that's the biggest thing we can do is cope because we have to live and then finally get to a point to where whatever the people think is none of our business. We have to not worry about what other people think. Mm -hmm. We have to worry about ourselves and our loved ones and then help anyone you can in life, all you you can. But the person has to help themselves when they want treatment. I I don't know the program. I, I, I haven't had to deal with it, and that's one of the graces of God for me, but... Did it help you to learn that it wasn't your fault? Did you feel when you went there that your drink, you made your father drink? That, was there a, a thought that's process? That's a great question, and you're right. It, they did let me know that I was, that was the neat part of the group of, of Alateen is that I've met other children that also have the same problems at home. And so then when my dad did blame it on me or my mom or my sisters, that we realized it was his fault, not ours, and we were able to overcome that adversity and that fear and that hurt and that crying that we had to go through. The cloak of guilt. Mm -hmm. That cloak of guilt. I call guilt man-made emotion to control man, but I bet your father used it. I bet... uh, He was the best con artist I ever met. (laughs) Really? Really? And at at this point in life, are you able to bless him and forgive him? I have blessed and forgiven him and let judge Jesus be the judge and not me. And uh, How did you come to that? I just want to hear... How did you come to the forgiveness? Find, finding myself that I'm okay and that I I love myself. I'm not in love with myself. There's a big difference. But everyone has to love their self before other people can love them. Marvelous, marvelous. That, thank you again for being here it's with an me. Honor. Thank you. You for, have been a great gift. The book is called From the Ground Up. Yeah, they can buy that at johnhoich.com. Okay. And it's uh, the, the it's written by John Lee Hoich. All my money goes to the recovery center and the and really, help alumni scholarships. Sales? Yes. Wow. 
So get this book, pass it on, because it teaches us a little bit about you can survive and thrive over life's lessons. Never give up. Never give up. Um, it says it's not just a business. You started with a what kind of lawnmower? A Sears Craftsman lawnmower. But making money is just something we all need to live on. Giving back and helping people is what we're all about. That's how we serve. Thank you again for being here, John. It's been an honor and a pleasure. We will come back with uh, Barney. Barney is from AA in another city. He's been a, a coach for that for 11 years. We'll talk to him. We'll be right back. This is Conversations with Susanna on the World Herald Live app. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about... You are exactly where you need to be right here, right now, as we learn to take control of our life, uh, no matter what life handles us. This is Conversations with Susanna. We started the hour with John Lee Hoyt, who has done a lot of wonderful things for this city, active with his actions to make the city better, to make life better for people who have gone through what he has done, and and survive and thrive like he has. Um, I want to thank John Lee Hoich for being here. Then we talked to Barney, who talked to us about AA. Um, there's always help out there. The, the problem is that in life, one of the things we don't do is we don't reach out. We don't ask for the support that is available to us all the time. The person at your next desk the person at your church, the person, there is always someone who will help you if you ask, but you'll have to reach out. I'm very proud of our guests that we had today. I'm also going to tell you that in, in my life, when I do appearances and when I do Facebook, I always post a positive thing every day to read. I also always do something positive every, um, with each show. This show is only going to be about empowering you. On Friday, we have someone coming on who will tell us about her trip down the road of life and the success she has made of herself. We're all about success. And success begins and ends with our ourself, and it begins with our decision to be successful. So, if you're not my Facebook friend, if you're not my Twitter friend, I want to read to you March's uh, phrase that I sent on on both of those. As a month that has us moving forward into the year, 
What is it we can leave behind to lighten our load? Are there limiting thoughts that keep us locked in yesterday's trouble? If so, let's take this month to recognize and release limiting thoughts of the past that no longer serves us. That's what our guests today have done. They have been given not the easiest load, not the easiest load to carry, but they took it, they survived, and they thrived. And then they made it better for others. And you will find as you reach out to others to support them, your life gets better. If you feel you're alone in the world, it is your illusion. We were not born not to support each other. We were born to be involved with each other because everyone, everyone has something they need to learn from us. So the affirmation for this month is, I recognize and release all thoughts that no longer serve me. So if you were given a thought like John Hoyt that said you would become nobody, he threw it away. He took his life. He made it better one lawn at a time. One lawn at a time. You can take your life. You can make it better with your decision to do it. And that's what it is. It's a decision. It's a thought of making your life better every day. And you can do it no matter where you've been. That is what this show is about. That's why we're here for you. Please join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 to 1. We'll be here talking about things that you can use around the watercolor to sound smart. We'll give you some information how to improve your life and improve those around you. We're each other's keepers. We can make the world better once we decide. Yes, you're where you need to be. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Conversations with Susanna. Right here for you to grow with us. We'll see you Friday.